Uh, welcome to this special lecture uh, presented by the Chinese language program. Uh, I'm Yang Ho, uh, the program coordinator. Uh, we are extremely uh, pleased and uh, honored to welcome Dr. Schneider uh, to come to the UN today. Uh, Dr. Schneider is a uh, distinguished scholar held in high esteem uh, in the field of Chinese studies. So in much of the world, uh, he's known as a famous uh, sinologist. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you are not familiar with the term, uh, just take it to me, someone who knows everything about China. <laughs> so, so we are in a very uh, intellectual tree uh, today. Uh, Dr. Schneider received his uh, PhD uh, in Chinese history from uh, uh, Ber uh, Bergen, University. Yeah, Bergen University in Germany. And uh, he's now working at uh, uh, Göttingen University uh, in various capacities. He's a professor of modern China studies and the director of uh, director of the Department of East Asian Studies and the director of the Center for Modern East Asian Studies. And he has uh, numerous publications written in German, uh, in English, and. Uh, in Chinese, of course. Uh, uh, Dr. Schneider is a fluent speaker of uh, Chinese. Uh, I previously sent you a link to a video uh, of a lecture he gave uh, exclusively in Chinese. Uh, did you watch it? I'm too surprised. I'm too impressed. Very uh, I must admit that uh, his Chinese is better than a lot of people in China. Uh, uh, so we were initially thinking of having him, uh, giving this lecture in Chinese. For it to cater to a wider audience, we finally gave up the temptation and uh, have him uh, speak in English today. Now let's welcome Dr. Schneider. Welcome everybody and uh, thank you Dr. Thurf for the very kind invitation to come here today and share with you some of my ideas about China's um, cultural encounter with modernity. Um, well, the thing I find interesting and, and very challenging to understand is a very widespread phenomenon that is ever since the beginnings of what we nowadays call modernity, that is ever since the 17th, 18th century onwards, we encounter time and again in various places of the world, um, emphasis on historical, cultural, political, and so on, economic particularity. All places are special, particular. Um, and as this is, of course, especially the case in uh, those parts of the world we call late development. Um, so, late developing countries are like, for example, Germany, in the early 19th century, late development. And then later, in mid 19th century, Russia, late 19th century, China. And in all these countries, we have a very strong emphasis on their own particularity. Uh, Jerome that was called Sonderly, a special German path, or in Chinese, uh, socialism is Chinese characteristics. So the emphasis is always on something of, of one's own, something particular. Um, and I try to understand why is that so? I mean, all these countries have to a certain degree, actually to a large degree, been copying and learning from the, at that time, advanced countries. Uh, in Germany, there was a case of, of, of in France, the Netherlands, and the UK. At the time where the advanced countries were, of course, the object of our study. And then later, um, when it came to China's modernization, it was, of course, next to Western Europe and um, the US. So, why are these countries time and again emphasizing their cultural and so on particularity? Um, what's the matter um, with being different from Western models of modernity? Why is this obsession so strong? Why is this obsession so strong? Because we encountered time and again, just recently in China, we have another round of emphasis on China, China being different. Now, before I, I suggest some possible explanations for this um, emphasis on particularity, let me give you a very short overview of the Chinese historical encounter with the West and how we have some, some basic shifts here. Basically, from the late 1870s, early 1880s onwards, in China, we observe a policy of modernization that, in the beginning, is so. Um, in the 1870s and 1880s, we observe a policy of modernization, which is basically focusing on technology and on industrialization. And at the very beginnings, of course, um, focusing on military technology. The challenge was to survive the imperialist onslaught coming from the West. 
Um, and this all was done within the framework of a strategy called the, the Tiyong formula, that is emphasizing that we keep our Chinese customs, our Chinese tea, but we just adopt some practical skills from the West. So adopting something from the West doesn't mean we have to change our culture, doesn't have to mean we have to change our way of thinking, it just means we adopt something useful. Of course, before long, the Chinese are realizing that this simply doesn't work, um, because technology and science and technology is linked to culture, it's linked to a certain view of the world. So in 1895, a big transformation, a big uh, change uh, occurred because the Chinese lost uh, a war, and it was a war against the Japanese. Um, a culture they deemed to be kind of a derivative of Chinese culture. So this was a big humiliation for the Chinese and from 1895 onwards then they started to move beyond a purely technological industrial uh, strategy of modernization and started to adopt political and also increasingly cultural aspects from the West. And this then in 1898 led to the uh, reforms of the Hundred Days. I mean they failed but in the end after 1901, after the uh, Boxer catastrophe in 1900, the Qing government started to actually implement quite a few of these suggestions um, and reform plans of 1898. And this, in the next step, then culminated in 1911, in the uh, after the Xinhai Revolution, in the adoption, at least in formal terms, of a Western political system of a republic. Um, but soon the Chinese realized adopting a, uh, a, a Western political system doesn't really make such a big difference. In the end, they thought at the time it was still culture that counts. We have to learn much more than just out of forms of organizing politics, much more than just technology. We have to actually understand the Western way of thinking. We have to understand Western culture. So this then uh, led to the uh, May 4th movement in 1919, uh, which also is called the New Culture Movement, uh, during which um, all kinds of ideologies, of ideas from the West were um, <coughs> discussed and uh, were scrutinized uh, for their, let's say, usefulness in a Chinese context. And then from then onwards, uh, basically we have kind of a, 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 an oscillation, a pattern of periods where um, the Chinese were um, very interested in theories from the West, followed very often by periods when they were kind of more conservative or more, let's say, moderate, more um, slowly moving forwards, um, sometimes even periods of, of, uh, of direct conservatism. So in, for example, 1923, we have a huge debate in China just right after the May 4th movement, the New Culture Movement, discussing whether Western science, which was um, considered to be at the heart of the modern West, um, whether Western science is actually sufficient to organize society and to, un and to understand uh, human life. And in this discussion, a, a very strong conservative position was voiced, and I was arguing against science that understood as being omnipotent uh, against scientism. Um, as history went on, we have these oscillating movements uh, time and again. So uh, the, uh, the Kuomintang, the nationalists who now still rule on Taiwan, uh, after the revolution of 1928, um, um, were actually trying to implement their policy, quite a revolutionary policy in fact. But then in 1933-34, they too somehow, at least, apparently turned more conservative because they emphasized Confucian values. Of course, Confucian values that were changed in considerable ways to, to fit the program for organization of the KMT. And if we want to, we can of course from here draw a line to the, we say, the emphasis in China nowadays on uh, Chinese tradition, the great Chinese tradition. Uh, uh, the Chinese government in the last 15 or 20 years has also adopted a policy that is not as anti-traditional as it used to be in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so what is actually, what has been happening in these uh, uh, 120, 130 years of China's encounter with the West? Well, I think what we can observe is a very deep and constantly increasing impact of Western learning, of Western culture in China. Um, first, we have a very fundamental change in the basic cosmology. That is, um, the Chinese, by and large, um, adopted the modern scientific worldview. To the point that the word, this is scientific or non-scientific, now it's in China, just, just means it's right or wrong. It's, it's actually a word for being right or wrong. It took up a question. It just means it's wrong. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's not scientific, it means it's wrong. Um, so, they adopted the modern scientific worldview, and I will say a few words about this later. Uh, for example, modern notions of time, of space, of history, 
of society, and so on and so forth. And then we see an encounter with and the reception of, adaptation of, sometimes even rejection of many aspects of Western modernity, such as concepts of popular sovereignty, concepts of the modern nation state, separation of state and religion, nationalism, democracy, rule of law, individualism, mandatory education, gender equality, and so on and so forth. All these, all these Western concepts found their way to China, of course changed in this process a lot, um, but had a huge impact on the modern, modern Chinese culture. And just because for lack of time I can't go into any details here, but just as an example, if you want to speak Chinese nowadays, if I would give this lecture in Chinese, I actually, I actually would talk English with Chinese words. So if you say politics in China nowadays, you don't say, you say Chinese, but it's actually politics. If you say state, you say Guojia, which is actually Kokka. It's the Japanese translation of the English word for state. Um, if you say nation, Minsu, it's Minsoku. It's a Japanese translation of the German word Nation. If you say society, you say Shihui, which is Chakai, which is Japanese translation of the English word society. You actually can't speak nowadays in Chinese about China without using terms of Western origin. It's, it's nearly impossible. If you would take out all loan words from a Chinese lecture nowadays, you would, maybe you would have 5% left. Um, so, which actually makes Chinese a perfect language for, let's say, global academic communication, because it is very rich um, with Western words at the same time, keeping a lot of, let's say, ways of expressing things that are not of Western origin. So, um, just looking at this example shows us how deep and how profound the impact of um, so-called Western learning was in China. Um, and yet, in spite of this very, very deep influence, and nobody can deny this influence, it's obvious, in spite of this very deep impact, and I could make the same case for, for example, a um, German encounter with French, um, with French Enlightenment philosophy, it's, it's quite similar. Or maybe late 19th century Russian encounter with Western modernity. This is a very similar phenomenon. Now, in spite of this very deep impact of Western modernity, we find time and again in China and other late different countries this emphasis on cultural particularity. Why is that so? So such an obsession with particularity. Well, I, in my uh, my observation of the field of research, I see three different suggestions why um, we have this emphasis on particularity. Um, the first one is saying that, well, these, um, these, this, this emphasis, uh, the emphasis on particularity is basically a question of cultural identity. Um, or as the late um, famous uh, American psychologist Joseph R. Levinson uh, coined it, the challenge was to become modern and yet stay Chinese. So how do you do that? You claim Chinese particularity. Um, and in the, in the end, it's just a claim. It could be just a claim. But maybe there's some substance to it. The point is, um, Levinson argued there is a difference in each society between history, which is mine, and value, which is true, about truth. You, you believe in certain values, you take these values to be true, applicable in the whole world, in every human society. At the same time, you have your own history, which is just your own history is mine. And if you have a huge <coughs> gap between you consider to be true and what's your history, you've got a problem. You have a, a very unstable society then. That's a bit like post-war Germany, where suddenly we had to prove that we have in all the time Democrats. So we, we, we dig up all those Western Democrats and declared that we were representing Germany. Um, or the German resistance against Hitler, which used to be working with Hitler until a year before they tried to kill him. Um, it's, of course, now the heroes of post-war German orientation towards the West. So Joseph Lenson was, was suggesting that the Chinese emphasis on particularity is basically out of a psychological need to to reassert your own cultural identity, to reassert your own cultural pride, uh, to not lose face. Um, and I don't want to say this is wrong. Of course, we all know that when you go as a foreigner um, to another place and you hear some judgments about your own country, you get very uh, well, defensive about it. Um, that's a very normal situation, um, especially if these claims are at least partly wrong, which mostly they are, of course. Um, but still, it's, it's, a very, um, it's very understandable, but I think it's, it's, um, it's not going far enough. Um, you cannot, you cannot ex explain um, this uh, obsession with particularity, with, with particular identity, just through a matter of like, a question of, of, of national or cultural pride. Um, this is definitely a part of it, but it's not enough. Well, the second uh, application of this uh, issue of particularity makes the argument 
that this emphasis uh, is pursuing political opinions, especially when put forward in contexts of dictatorial settings, such as the German emphasis on this special German path towards modernity for Sonderweg, or the Chinese communist emphasis on uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. In both cases, so this argument, emphasis on particularity is nothing but an attempt um, at providing a dictatorial system with additional legitimacy. That's the whole point. It's asserting that we go our own, our own way and hence we don't have to be, become Democrats. Um, just keep your Western values outside of uh, our China or outside of our Germany or whatever country. Um, and this is a way of providing a, a regime that lacks legitimacy or doesn't have enough legitimacy with additional support. Again, I think uh, it is obvious this argument isn't totally wrong. This might happen, but it doesn't explain from my point of view our story. It is, again, just too narrow an explanation, too limited in scope and explanation to explain, to explain why people are, even people outside of the regime, people who are not members of the party or not members of the government, academics, why they time and again come back to the issue of particularity. So, identity, yes, a bit, but not sufficient. Um, political legitimacy, yet, okay, fine, but again, I think not, not sufficient. There's a third explanation, and then a fourth one, but I first focus on the third one, which I think is more profound. That is, we find in, in actually research on modernization, um, from the 70s onwards, um, a realization of the fact that modernization is path dependent. So the way a country modernizes depends on the path it has been following. And all paths are different, because it depends, how you modernize depends on first, of course, your own cultural historical background. And, maybe even more important than that, it depends on the point of entry into the global system. When you enter the global system, especially the global market, at a point in time, we have certain conditions. This, of course, influences, limits your, your options. But for example, Taiwan's modernization in the 60s and 70s happened under the conditions of the Cold War economic regime. Very good for Taiwan, very easy for Taiwan modernized at the time. The same is true for Japan after, the, after World War II and for Germany after World War II. All of these three areas were modernizing the very favorable conditions. Again, of course, against different historical backgrounds, but this was a very important factor in understanding why we had these economic miracles in these three areas, especially in the 50s and 60s. And you can make the argument for nearly every country that the point, point of time of entry into the world system is important. The conditions from where we start, what kind of, let's say, economic system we had before, you know, what's the relation between, let's say, um, culture and manufacture, the type of, uh, and the way you recruit your political needs, um, your, your geographic, your strategic position always influences the way you can actually modernize. So this is path dependency, which in the 70s and 80s was a very strong argument for um, pluralizing our research on processes of modernization in different parts of the world. And in recent years, especially after the end of the Cold War, um, when we started to believe, for right or for wrong, that socialism is dead, and we tried to come up with a new theory um, that actually goes this very long, this very vague term, path dependence. And this theory is now um, very popular, very fashionable. Um, it's called the theory of multiple modernities. So that modernity is not a unified system with one path and one goal and one kind of uh, uh, setup in the relation of politics, economics, and society. Now, modernity is of course characterized by some core aspects, otherwise we could call the same systems all modern, but it's multiple. It's multiple in two ways. It's multiple in the way it different systems reach the point of modernity, so the path argument is still included, and it's multiple in the, in the, in the, in the meaning of we can actually have different outcomes. So there are, there's not one modernity, there are different modernities. And um, it is at this point where beyond the issues of identity and political legitimacy, we can start making sense of the obsession with particularity by cultural, economic, and political elites. Because directly facing a situation where adopting the Western model was not an option because it wouldn't work. Because these elites were familiar with their conditions. These elites were familiar with the point of time of entry into the world system. 
they knew that adopting this system would be disastrous in the context. They had to adopt another way. So they, they, they were kind of out of necessity, out of the necessity to modernize. They had to focus, they had to do research on, they had to reflect on the question of what is different in our case? And how do we translate this difference into different strategies of organization? So um, I think that it's in this context of the theory of modern learnings, is that the reference to cultural, economic, and political and so on particularities um, does make much more sense than in just uh, the context of uh, the, the, the uh, um, explanation through factors like identity and legitimacy. Um, and yet, um, a core of modernity, of course, must be maintained. Otherwise, you cannot call the same uh, different countries all modern. So what is this core of, of, of modernity? Of course, this is hotly contested, I wonder. Um, but um, I think uh, uh, one core of the, of the uh, yeah. notion of modernity is still basically capitalist economy. Uh, the, the basics of the economic system are capitalist. Um, but beyond that, you have lots of theories what, is, uh, what are the, the, the core aspects of modernity. Um, now, under this theory of modern modernity can have similar phenomena like industrialization, social differentiation, and so on and so forth. But we also can have different ways to modernity, and we can have different outcomes. For example, different concepts of democracy, different notions of sovereignty, or different cultural arrangements, such as different emphasis on family, different ways of communication, different systems, different cultures of human interaction, and so on and so forth. Um, so to sum things up, um, I think that the, uh, the notion of multiple modernities um, is actually quite helpful in going beyond an explanation of uh, the emphasis on particularity through, just through identity and legitimacy. And yet, at the point in time when China is modernizing uh, at very high speed and has now reached uh, levels of affluence and, uh, and world success, that nobody, not even the, the darkest uh, China haters, can deny this anymore. Um, um, right at this point, we observe a um, critique of this theory in China. Uh, there are recently, the last 10 15 years, voices saying, well, this notion of modernity, they maybe not going to use the term, but they mean this explanation. Um, it is um, it's not really so effective. So, what are these critical voices? Now, um, with regard to the current situation in the People's Republic of China, um, because from the perspective of political legitimacy and cultural identity, from these two aspects, looking at the problem of particularity and then the theory of modern identities, still carry the risk of factual westernization in many fields of society, culture, and eventually also politics. So um, you observe um, in the PRC the last 10 or 15 years uh, a young generation growing up that is more used to Starbucks than to hotels. Uh, that is more used to the internet than to, let's say, uh, Chinese local media. That is more used to, let's say, uh, pop culture coming from the West um, than to Chinese traditional music, whatever that is. Um, and, of course, we could make sense of the recent emphasis in the PRC, uh, especially now with the new leadership of uh, Xi Jinping, um, um, the, the renewed emphasis on socialism as Chinese characteristics um, and to resist Western values, as um, a critique, as a fear of, um, of, of, of factual westernization. Um, I'm not sure, it's too early to judge that. I have my doubts about this explanation. It's this just being a reaction against a threat of westernization. I think it goes much deeper. But um, it's too early to say. The reason why I refer to this recent development in China is very simple. I think whatever we, however we look at claims of cultural or political particularity, um, there are always, always a very close connection um, between cultural change, the question of politics and political legitimacy, and academic debates. And what we observe currently in China is actually, is actually such an interplay of culture, politics, and academia. It's a very close interplay, it's a very interesting interplay. It's too early to say what will come out of it, um, but it's one critical voice in the last two or three, four years that's getting stronger. Uh, a voice critical of the, of the Westernizing implications of modern modernities. Now, the second critique in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, that is having some impact in China, um, 
is coming from the so-called Chinese New Left. Um, um, because they argue that the concept of modern modernity is, still maintains certain core characteristics, such as a basically capitalist economic system. And they, they argue that this capitalist system is, is, is morally corrupt, socially irresponsible, and from a perspective of environment, just untenable. We, we can't go on in this way. It's not, it's not justified. So we have to change it. However, these leftists, this new left, they base their critique not on arguments of um, historical or cultural particularity, but rather on an internationalist vision of a just and sustainable society. So their critique of modern modernity is not motivated by considerations of cultural particularity. It's motivated by exactly the opposite. They want an international, just and sustainable society. And there's a third there's a third critique that in the last 20 years has become stronger and stronger, also not really dominant, far from dominant, but it's a voice we didn't hear for 40 years, and now it's there again, so I think it's quite, it's quite interesting. Um, and this third voice um, is a voice saying, um, uh, modernity is wrong. It's not the multiple modernity, it's not the multiple about modernity is wrong, it's a modernity about modernity that is wrong. They're actually anti-modern critical of some core aspects of modernity. And um, these people in China are very often called cultural conservatives. And um, through analyzing these forces, I think we can gain an additional understanding of China's encounter with modernity, and especially China's cultural encounter with modernity. But before, and here I have to ask for your patience, before I introduce the, the arguments of these people, we first have to go back a little bit in history and say, okay, if they are against modernity, then what are they actually against? What is modernity? And I've been using this <coughs> all the time and I'm not explaining it. So what is modernity? And when we think of modernity, we have lots of terms popping up in our pockets like industrialization, rationalization, social differentiation, individualism, democratization. Sometimes we even include, like in uh, Max Weber's case, the dark side of modernity, such as a loss of orientation, social enemy, and so on and so forth. Um, all of this is, of course, correct, but I think it doesn't dig deep enough. Um, when I talk about modernity and I talk about critique in China of modernity, especially this cultural conservatives, um, I understand modernity as a system of three um, essential aspects. Um, first, modernity is a certain worldview and a concomitant epistemology, a concomitant theory of knowledge. Second, modernity is a certain view of time and change. That is a certain view of history. What is history? How does, how does society change? That's, that's new in the modern period. And the third aspect of modernity is a critical self-reflective awareness. Um, let me just talk about these three aspects in a, a bit more detail. So when we talk about modernity being a certain worldview and a related epistemology, what does it mean? Well, we have first go back in the Western context to the pre-modern, pre-Renaissance period, actually. It is, you have to go to the medieval, uh, 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 to medieval history. In the medieval period, um, in their self-understanding, mankind was part of divine creation, divine cosmos. Mankind was not something separate from the world. It was part of the world, it was in the world. God created this world and they, God created us as part of that world. Full stop. And our position in the world is fixed. There's nothing to discuss about this position. There's nothing that can be changed about this position. This is a divine creation. And this is the, the most basic and most revolutionary transformation of modernity. Because what happens is that man steps out of creation. It turns the cosmos created by God previously into a world to look at to investigate, to understand its principles, and thus to manipulate it, transform it. In other words, the previously divine creation is turned into an object to gaze at. It's becoming a world, no longer a cosmos. Hence, we speak now um, of modernity as the epoch of the world view. As soon as you can look at something, it's, it's no longer you. It's something that is distant from you. Things that are, you are a part of, you can't look at. You can't look at your heart. You can't look at something you're a part of, but once you tear it out, 
or if you take something, look at it, then it's, then it's something different. It becomes an object. And the, the position of mankind in divine creation was a position of being part of it. There's nothing to look at. Looking implies a subject that looks at an object. There was no concept of subject and object before the Enlightenment. So what happens is that the world, the cosmos is turned into a world you can look at, and by looking at it you can investigate it, you can understand its rules, its laws, you can change it, you can manipulate it. You just look around what we've done before. This is not God's creation, for sure not. Um, this is something we did after we kind of stepped out of that divine creation. Um, so, and in line with, with this transformation of our position in the world, we redefine ourselves. What previously was part of God's creation, that is mankind, is now becoming a modern subject that actually defines the world around itself as an object. It's the objectification of our environment, turning this environment into a world. And of course, all this goes back to a French philosopher, René Descartes, um, and his famous philosophical statement, Cobito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And this is the declaration of power of the subject. Here I am, I think, this is one I am. This is the only reason I am, and all the rest is the object of my investigation. This Cobito ergo sum, the heart of modern science, becomes what's of modernity, because it defines mankind as a subject with the world as its object, it moves mankind as the center of the universe. Only then can we talk about humanism. There was no great humanism, because mankind was not the center of the world. Once we mankind moves to the center position, we can, we can actually can justifiably talk about humanism. And Descartes, of course, through this famous dictum, um, defined an epistemology of knowing, a theory of knowing that is formative to the present day. Here, the subject and its senses, they're the object to be investigated. And once you cross the borderline between subject and object, you're subjective. You're talking about it. Basically, you're just no longer reliable. Because you. Um, so this is the first aspect of modernity that is that we very often tend to forget when we talk about the modern period. This is a very fundamental change. The second fun change, as fun fundamental as, as one just mentioned, is uh, a change in the view of time and a change in the view of change. How do things develop? What happens when things develop? Now, in the medieval period, um, there was a very clear distinction between the world here, that is the historical and secular realm where we live now, and then you have the paradise there, the divine realm. In the conception of the secular world and its history, um, history doesn't have a direction. In the medieval period, history is not moving forwards. It's not moving backwards, it's not moving at all. History is just recording what human beings did, and from, this, from these stories you learn what's wrong and what's right. It's, it's a storybook full of moral lessons. This is history, the medieval period, secular history. And secular history is actually meaningless. There is no sense of direction, there is no objective, there is no aim, no telos in it. Um, <coughs> No inner dynamic, no logic of development is in this secular history. Whereas in the divine realm, there is no change at all. There is no history. Paradise doesn't develop. It's just there. It's the final state of bliss. And there is no structural relation between the two. There is the secular world and you have the divine world. And you can move from one to the other at the last day. The final world. Actually. You can cross, but this crossing is not historical development. It's actually the end of history. Now, in the modern times, um, this concept is being replaced first by the Enlightenment notion of progressive history. Now, what used to be a, a, a notebook full of moral stories turns into a progressive, rational process. Now, history is following certain rules of development. You can actually predict it. And this development is actually from so getting from good to better to better. It's, it's actually also in many cases, uh, aiming at a final perfect state. In some cases, it's not having a final goal, it's just getting better and better, forever better. But in many of these early theories of progress, there is a, a final point, the end of history, when, when things basically have reached a, perf a state of perf perfection. 
there's no divine realm left. All of this, all of this happens on Earth. There is no non-earthly realm left in the Enlightenment notion of history. So history is progressive. It's comprehensive. Everything progresses. From technology to the quality of human character. Everything is getting better and better. Human, human beings in the perfect state do no longer commit any evil acts. We have become all little, little tiny gods. It's a, it's a wonderful world. If you, if you read Condorcet, it, it, it reads this. It's, it's wonderful. From a post-45 perspective, it's not so wonderful after all, but um, when you read this um, Enlightenment philosophy about, about history, you see a lot of hope, you see a lot of, actually, enthusiasm about, about history. People are really getting excited about this, because they suddenly think they realize, now that we have liberated ourselves from God, from, 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 from theology, and we have liberated ourselves from all kinds of superstition, we can rely on our human, on human reason and rework the world can actually create a perfect world. So history in the Enlightenment sense of the Saturn is comprehensive, it's linear, it's directed, it's following a certain logic. And of course, all of this isn't possible without, now we go back to the notion of worldview, um, about the transformative powers we have acquired. Because we have stepped out of creation, now we can revert the world according to human reason. We can turn it into something better. So Latin philosophers were convinced that the state of mankind can get better and better. As long as we follow reason, basically nothing should go wrong. It's a process of liberation. And this is what is called history with a capital H. It is a worldwide, unified, universal process of improvement. Um, with or without an aim doesn't make a difference um, for the nature of this process because it's, it's a benign process, it's a progressive process. Histories in that language. But um, contrary to many postmodern claims, in the West, this notion of history in capital H was shattered in the late 18th century by the French Revolution. Because the French Revolution, first, wasn't benign, it was terror, pure terror. Second, it didn't lead to what they thought it would lead to. So, first, it wasn't benign. Second, um, the predicted goal, the envisaged goal, the progress towards it better didn't happen, it didn't occur. Things went in unexpected and partially undesirable directions. And just in the wake of, of these experiences, in the context of the French Revolution, where, especially of an not exclusively in Germany, history is in capital H, was turned into history with a minor H, a small H, big H. And this is um, now. Italian, German, also some French, some British philosophers were emphasizing the particularity of different epochs and different cultures. Because the experience of the French Revolution is that this benign capital H process of history just doesn't happen. What we have is unexpected terms. What we have is different conditions in different countries. What we have is um, that a process that looks like a benign <coughs> process history with the capital H process actually turns out to be a process of terror. So um, they started to rethink history in such ways that it would give space for difference. It would give space for cultural difference, it would give space for temporal difference. And this is where people like uh, Herder comes into play, emphasizing the particularity of cultures without giving up a universal vision. So Herder was still a nationalist. And this is thinking of the world of nations, good place to talk about the world of nations, but of world of nations where all nations are equal but all are different. And different in very fundamental ways. And we have to learn from each other. So it's not necessarily a nationalist concept as we use the term nationalist nowadays after two world wars. It was in, in a period of time when nationalism was still a positive term. Basically an anti-monarchical term. Um, so history is no longer um, capital H history. It's no longer a universal yardstick to touch everything else according to this new standard. It's not a monodirectional linear process of progress. It's not something that is very, let's say, diverse, heterogeneous. It's very unpredictable. And here actually are the roots of what we until recently used to call the postmodern condition. Well, we have now moved to the post secular age, allegedly, I'm not sure, but anyway, um, the postmodern condition is actually having its roots there. This notion of, of history is not being directed, is not being unified, 
found its way through Nietzsche, through Heidegger, to Sartre, and the, the postmodern philosophy. And they actually, on the basis of this pedigree, arguing against the history of the capital age, the Enlightenment concept of history. Now, the third aspect of modernity that we very often tend to overlook because it has become so absolutely self evident that we don't think about it anymore is modernity as an epoch of critical self reflective awareness. What does it mean? Have been people before uncritical? Well, yes and no. Um, I think we have to understand this. Um, I think I, I try to use the, the metaphor of a stage. When the world it's no longer a cosmos given to you by God, but it's a world that you actually can research, can explain, can manipulate, then you are faced with choices. And you have four people doing research in the world and they have all different opinions. Who's wrong, who's right? There might be the end of wrong or right. So what this liberation from the divine creation created is a situation where mankind, where researchers had to make choices. And with choices were not very often not a question of right or wrong, but just different options. So we, be, we became men that became something like an actor on stage. Hence, in a lot of research, modernity is also called the age of theatricality. From the new, another new word, the age of theatricality. Because now people move on stage. When you when you are, when you are on stage, you you you, you play a game. You, you act out a game. Um, you do it like this, and then that's the plot. Or let's change the story. Let's do something different. So you're no longer kind of unreflective. You're no longer just natural. The tornado nowadays is so it's, it's a poison word. It's natural. People who claim something to be natural nowadays are, are in danger. But this is because we are modern. So natural is no longer taken for granted. People now have to kind of, um, they're always on stage. They're always being looked at. And they can always, they're always aware of the fact that the play they're acting out now could be a different story. They could, they could, from all, they could be on a different stage and, and act out more in a different, different way. So, modernity is self reflective awareness, means we lose a lot of self confidence. Because things are not just the way they are. Things are always going the way they could be, but they also could be different. Which, of course, is the way of the heart of the politician going through the arrangements too. So, I mean, that's the third aspect of modernity. Um, which is, in a way, the outcome of the first two aspects, just another uh, angle. Now, let's move back to China. Time is running out, and I know we have until time until 5.30, right? 5.10 or so. Oh, that was last year, Okay, okay. Well, then I, then I hurry up. Um, well, um, let me talk, cut the debate, let me just talk about the so-called cultural conservatives. Uh, in China. These are people who from the late 1890s onwards already have voiced concerns about what's coming from the West. Um, and these people have been silent basically after the 1940s and 1950s. Um, first in the PRC, 1949, the cultural conservatives were basically extinct. And in Taiwan, under KMT rule, they were kind of um, not very influential either um, until about the 1960s when the KMT staged an anti cultural revolution movement in China called the Movement for the Revival of the National Culture of, of, of China. This was an anti cultural revolution movement, and some, some of these conservative arguments were used for this movement for very obvious political reasons, um, trying to bolster the legitimacy of a regime that didn't have much of that. Now, um, what did these cultural conservatives say? Um, I could spend the next four days talking about this because I'm writing a book on this, but I don't do it. Um, um, basically, there are two, three, four arguments that are not particularly Chinese. You can see the same arguments brought forward by German or Russian or Indian conservatives. But the arguments um, are first, the whole notion of us being a subject vis a vis an object is completely flawed. It's an epistemology that destroys the holistic unity of man and universe. It empowers mankind to go nuts, to go wild and destroy the planet. It's just totally arrogant. Just cut it. Stop it. You're destroying yourself. You're dehumanizing humanity. Um, this is very uh, first um, a very fundamental argument. The second one is saying that modern, the modern notion of man being rational is dangerously arrogant. 
because it underestimates <coughs> human potential for irrationality. It underestimates human potential for committing evil acts. And if we look at the Holocaust, well, well there is a point to that. Um, so mankind needs to be restrained by the forces external to itself. Be it universal ethical standards about human rights that cannot be doubted, or be it a cosmic or divine order that is given. There's a given order, just buy it, just, just don't doubt it, just accept it. Um, that's another very typical conservative argument. And then the third, and I could add many more, is that modern concepts of time and change um, are actually nothing but the philosophical basis of economic capitalist processes that are at their heart inhumane, because they sacrifice humanity for the purpose of increasing profit, constant uh, increase of, of efficiency, um, constant competition. Um, this creates a wonderful material world, but it destroys humanity and the trade of humanity. Again, as I just said, these arguments are not specific for China, but they acquire a certain Chinese flavor once they are tied back to either Buddhist, Taoist, or Confucian traditional notions of mankind, the cosmos, and the nature of things. Um, and this is exactly what has been happening in China ever since the late 19th century. That is, Chinese conservatives have been arguing not just that the modernity is wrong, they've been arguing there is a Chinese solution to that. Christianity cannot actually solve the problem. Why? Because Christianity is actually already empowering mankind because human beings in the divine, in the Christian worldview, are elevated at a very special level. They're very particular. They're actually already quite close to controlling the divine creation. Um, we need a philosophy like the Confucian, the Buddhist of those one that actually says, well, there is, there is the unity of, of heaven and mankind. And, and, and this is what can rescue the world, nothing else. Um, so once these conservatives add to the arguments I just mentioned, um, claim that there are um, Chinese solutions to the problem, there is a claim to China's particularity that has actually universal implications. Because now a modern condition, which is universal, can be solved, can be remedied with the help of particular Chinese cultural achievements, which thus acquire a, a universal importance. Now, we, we can think of these arguments whatever we want. It's not the point of saying what's right or what's wrong. I mean, that's, that's something we discuss separately. But why, why are these so-called cultural conservatives now important for our topic here of, of cultural particularity? Well, for two reasons. One is that ever since the mid-1990s, um, we observe in China the return, in quotation marks, because it's a return to tradition. Um, being it in the veteran of government, be it society, um, in the form of, for example, the national studies sphere, that is a return in China to a lot of, let's say, research that had been done on Chinese culture in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. A lot of famous Chinese historians and philosophers had been reflecting on these issues already from a non Nazi perspective. They had been silenced for over half a century, and now the 1990s, they are being revived again, become cultural heroes of Chinese academia in the 1990s. Um, <clears throat> so there's a return, at least in, in argumentation, to some seemingly traditional, let's say, claims or arguments. Um, how far they go, of course, is contested. Whether the government really is serious about its reference to Confucius or to Buddhism, some seems, of course, contested. Uh, governments are governments for good reason. Um, in philosophers, but even in philosophy, even in historical research, we see a lot of, um, let's say, interest in Chinese traditions coming back. There's a second change in China in the last 10, 15 years, especially in the last 10, 15 years, which is, uh, for my point of view, actually quite surprising. I would have never expected this to happen with this kind of speed and, and, and impact. That is, we see the last 10, 15 years in China an astounding revival of Chinese traditional cults of Chinese religions. Not of Chinese religions, but also of Western religions. Christianity is very, you know, has a very deep impact on China uh, currently, and it's the fast, fastest growing religious community in China. And especially, of course, the um, Protestant denominations. Now, what is, what is about this religious survival in China? 
here Taoism is not so strong, uh, but Chinese uh, religious traditions, especially Confucius and Buddhism, that start, start to have an impact. Now this revival is, whether it's a revival in the first place, some sort of discuss it, because what comes back is not what was there before, of course not, so there's not, not really a revival is happening, but it's a return of the religious, it's a return of, of, of belief, of faith, of superstition, in the words of a scientistic believer. Um, this revival is very heterogeneous. There are all kinds of reasons why people go back to temples, why people start saying I'm Buddhist or I'm Confucian, why people send their children to Confucian primary schools, schools that they use some Confucian terms to kind of attract students. Um, it's very complicated in its relation to politics, in its relation to business, um, and its relation to traditional um, arrangements um, in temples. And it's actually too much too early to, 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 to judge um, the nature of the revival and to bring forward some intelligent guesses about its future fate. But this revival, this is my, uh, uh, my, my, my belief, I think it, it hints at, um, at a deep-rooted dissatisfaction with the modern condition in some parts of China society. So, put in simple terms, um, people say, well, I've got two cars, three houses, and four, whatever, um, and I'm still not happy. Um, that's a very cynical way of putting it. Uh, you can turn it around and say, people start to realize that all that affluence and all that, um, what people actually are praising in China, the last 20, 25 years, China has been developing in amazing ways. Um, I'm still stunned. I was the first time in China in 1981, and I just don't think it's the same planet. It's a different world. Um, it's really stunning. It was very positive and very, let's say, um, uh, laudable, let's say, consequences for lots of Chinese people. And still, people are saying, and you hear this very often, well, I'm still not happy. I don't, I don't buy it. I think what, is, what this modern transformation is doing to us is, at least in some aspects, are quite negative. Well, again, um, the point, well, the reason why I refer to that is not to discuss here whether this is a good or a bad development on its jury to judge, and everybody of us might have a different opinion on that. Um, but I think um, it, it again shows us um, that the emphasis on Chinese cultural particularity is not just a matter of identity, it's not just a matter of political legitimacy, it's actually a matter of very deep rooted concerns with A, the question of modernity. Do we have multiple modernities, and if yes, what's multiple about them, what's one about them? What is particular, what is universal about them? That's a very uh, concrete, a very challenging um, concern, be it in politics, when it's about strategies of modernization, is it in academe, uh, when it's about explaining what has happened. And this is, I think, the heart of the whole discussion of particularity um, uh, in, in large parts of Chinese and other societies. And there's also the other coin um, that is, um, even in these criti positions critical of modernity, we have an emphasis on the particular Chinese contribution to a critique of the modern process. And again, here too, more with the universal concern, but still um, an emphasis on what contribution Chinese tradition could do, or could make uh, towards um, improving the current, from the perspective of these people, the broader state of mankind. And many of these arguments put forward in the Chinese cultural conservative critique of modernity are actually arguments um, that you can't find in Western conservatism. Um, Western conservatism is, with regard to these questions, quite different because Western conservatism nowadays, um, is, at least in, in Europe, doesn't have much of a spiritual, doesn't have much of a religious um, content. It's much more about uh, a certain view of mankind is much more about a certain uh, uh, position on social and political arrangements, not so much about a more philosophical uh, doubt about the very nature of what's in Here in China, I think we have a, a deeper awareness of that, of that very deep-rooted revolution that modernity in the 17th and 18th century actually was. Well, I hope this was not too extra. Thank you for your attention. Uh, my question is, uh, I always get this impression that because China had such a long written history, and also had always this centralized 
government imposing some direction on cash chain talk in general. So they seem to have a, a, a quite strong, robust self-awareness, which might be different from other commentators like Western historians. So how is it changing? Uh, is it a very strong factor? And the second question is, you said uh, there is a proportion of uh, conditions and uh, cuts in the region. I thought, you know, uh, in, in the past, it was very strong, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a revival of person, except in Tibet, which is totally separate from this thing. Very strong. That's my question. Uh, the last question is that I'm a beginner uh, Chinese student. How much is a problem or help if you uh, do it at the same time, Japanese kanji? Is it helpful for learning Chinese kanji or it's actually interfered? So the first question was about the central government and uh, um, whether that's a difference. Well, I, 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 I do believe that this basic challenge of facing dirty is actually universal for all late developing countries. Um, the conditions of facing it are all different. Um, so just look at just a very simple example. You have South Korea, you have Korea and Taiwan, both Japanese colonies between uh, in the, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and both embarked on very different paths of modernization after 1945. Because South Korea was built by the Japanese into an industrial base, and Taiwan into an agricultural base, or in the very last years of the Japanese occupation, light industry. So, so Korea was very successful at building heavy industry after the war, and Taiwan was fit. Um, so we have a very specific arrangement leading very specific outcomes. Um, on the, the, the point of the central government, I wouldn't overestimate this claim about the central government in Chinese tradition. Um, the, 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 the court of the emperor was a very weak thing. It was a tiny, tiny weak thing. If you look at the, 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 the huge majority of the Chinese population, or the population of what is called China, um, um, they never had any contact with that bureaucracy. Um, the, the lowest official, state official, um, in the Chinese judicial system was the county magistrate. But what, how, how, how big is a county? Millions of people sometimes. Um, and now we have, for a little town of 100,000 inhabitants, we have a, a, staff, a group of, of administrators in the city government of four, five, six hundred, administrating 100,000. And before we had one, four, seven million. So I think that um, the, the whole notion of this autocratic, very strong, powerful Chinese imperial government, I think is completely flawed. It was actually very weak. What it, of course, did achieve is, is to uh, enforce a leading ideology for the level of bureaucrats, the state officials. These people had a very similar way of thinking as state officials. As private individuals, they could be Taoists. It didn't have to be confusion. So even that is not unified. So I'm, I'm not so sure about this, this argument about the Chinese tradition of a strong central government being um, a, a, a very important factor for the course of modernization in China. I think what is much more interesting and actually stunning from our point of view that all pre modern empires have basically disintegrated under the impact of modernization. Be it the Holy Roman uh, Empire of the German nation, be it the Austrian awesome Empire, the Habsburg Empire, the Russian Empire, all, all collapsed basically. The Russian Empire was turned into the Soviet Union but then eventually also collapsed. The only empire that survived the onslaught of modernity is China. Why? I have no idea. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, your second question was about. Buddhism. Oh, yeah, Buddhism. Well, there is an astonishing rise of Buddhism in China nowadays. Oh. Absolutely mind boggling. Uh, especially, of course, especially of Tibetan Buddhism among Han Chinese. Uh, it's all over the place. So if you can go to China, if you went to China 20 years ago, you, temples were actually cultural sites where you could pay entrance fees. Um, and you could see mostly tourists. If you go to China nowadays, many, many temples, there are no entrance, entrance fees anymore. And the majority of people going there are actually. Either curious people or, or really devotees, believers. Um, of course, why do you believe in something? You can have very different reasons. You can, you can go to a Buddhist temple just once, twice a year, right before the next high school entrance exam. And, uh, somebody might help you or not. Or you can go every day. Um, this, this is very diverse, and the forms of influence control by the government are also changing and also very different. But it is, of course, an Interesting fact that the first time ever that a Chinese leader has mentioned Buddhism as something positive in China has been in Xi Jinping last year in France. Where he referred to Buddhism as saying, well, this is actually something good. Of course, that's not new. 
Watching the Westminster is the same thing, but not in front of Western cameras, not in front of Western microphones, but in party high school meetings, where he was saying in 2008, we have to rebuild ethics, we have to rebuild morality with Catholic schools. Um, uh, and this was a, a statement that leaked out then uh, to the media. Uh, so, Putin is, is coming back, or is reinventing itself, I don't know how to phrase that, but it's, 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 it's quite having an impact. It's not powerful in the sense of a powerful organization. Not political. Not political. And where it gets political, it's getting dangerous. Um, so they know where the, where the borders are, where, they, where the, the limits are. But it's, it's having an impact. And the first um, organization that was in Sichuan in 2008, providing relief for the victims of the earthquake, was actually a Buddhist institution. Even before the state organization, it was the Buddhist where they are trying to help. Uh, so, in the, in the fields of let's say, social welfare, um, 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 charity, um, but also education, uh, business associations um, are quite influential. And by the way, when it comes to this, it doesn't matter where they, where they are from. The most influential lay Buddhist and Buddhist organization in mainland China is from Taiwan. Registered in New York, actually, here, it's in City Gong Dehoi. But they have a huge impact uh, in China because they actually stay away from politics, as they stood away from politics in, in Taiwan. They're just trying to do good work. But kanji, what was it again? <laughs> Japanese in the Chinese kanji, but learning Japanese kanji help with learning Chinese kanji. No. How much commonality, like in public science or geographic names? No, no. It doesn't happen. So I tried both in Africa. Just focus on Japanese. <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, you talk about kanji, right? There's yes, no yeah. Japanese characters. Yeah, Japanese yeah, characters so are like Chinese characters. Yeah, the word they call kanji. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, so what I was saying was, so it's useful, yes. If you learn Japanese kanji. It's no, it's not kanji. useful. No, no, it, 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 it's, it's not useful because first, uh, pronounced differently. Second, there are different pronunciations for the same character in Japanese. Uh, there's a Chinese, a, a Chinese reading and a Japanese reading. And third, they're abbreviated, they are simplified in different ways. Uh, th th last but not least, we only have 1,800 kanjis, which is not much. And only about 800 of them are in constant use, and thousands of them are not so, so commonly used. But in China, you have, well, for let's say, um, basic reading, 4 to 5,000. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very different. Yes, please. Um, it's more a comment rather yeah. than a question. Two strands of what said. Um, first, the, the critique of the conservatives about uh, modernity. I think that's applicable not only in China. I, I'm from Ethiopia, and I, I would definitely would agree with that. And I think that critique is also applicable even in the Western countries. I think it's, it's yeah. universal. Yeah. And the other interesting thing is you mentioned uh, Buddhism. Buddhism now, it's not only having a revival in China, but it's spreading in the West, like, like wildfires. And the interesting thing about Buddhism is that um, it, it does not, what you said about sep the separation of man, the object objectification of subject and object, Buddhism says there is no subject and object. We're all one. It brings back the unity of the universe and also the, the notion that we are all, each of us, a part of a larger whole. And, you know, taking care of the natural environment and all that and ethics. So, it's just a comment. Well, I think, this is, I, mean, I think you're right. These concept arguments are actually universal. They take on different forms and sometimes they're quite astonishing different forms in different places, depending on different cultural traditions. But the basic the core argument, I think, is universal. Um, and you're right about, about, about Buddhism, but I think the, this, this emphasis on the unity of, of man and the world, mankind and the world, I think it's also true for, for Taoism too, and also for, for Confucianism. So it's, it's not a, a purely Buddhist position. Yeah, and in the way, even um, all, the, all the traditions, the spiritual traditions, in the, way, in the end, yes. that's what they lead to. Yes, I but I think that in, in monotheistic uh, traditions, it's, it's a bit more complicated. Yes, yes. It's a big guy out there. Anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, you know. Just a quick the, question. Yeah. What's the title of your book? And when is it coming out? Um, oh, that's a thorny question. 
Where was he? I've been asking, people have been asking me this question since 2010. I had to buy about it. The answer was changing. <laughs> um, the title will be um, Ethics and History uh, Conservative Reflections on uh, America, uh, focusing on China. And um, may I not answer your question? Probably. Yeah, maybe we'll get the skills. Why we set up the room? Because there is a class. It's not a discussion, but it's just a comment also following up on. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on a very, very interesting lecture. It, it sheds light because you come from different people from different parts of the world, and I come from Egypt, and we come from Belgium, and we're talking about.